Hello and welcome. Well, I'd love to ask you a question. How are you coping with everything at the moment? You know, there's no doubt that these last few months that life has been really tough with the whole family living on top of each other, trying their best to manage and juggle living, working from home, um, and everyone's been living under each other's noses, under one roof, 24-7. I guess when you think about it, it really is a recipe for disaster. And talking about recipes, at least they generally come with directions and step-by-step -step instructions. And this whole COVID-19 era surely did not. <laughs> so with everyone trying their very best, it doesn't hurt to have some guidance and to help us through this challenging time. Um, we're going to speak to our, um, our special guest today. We're really thrilled to welcome Martine Oglethorpe. Now she's a digital wellbeing and online safety educator, otherwise known as the modern parent. Now Martine Oglethorpe is a mother to five boys, which is incredible. <laughs> and she has a background in secondary education and she has a master's in counselling. And through her personal and professional work with families, um, raising children, um, she recognised the important role that technology plays uh, in the lives of children today and in the role that we can play um, in our day-to-day -day lives and also not just that but the safety and the social emotional well-being that we have to be aware of given that we spend our lives online so much and Mar Martine is going to share with us her five well-being tips to live learn and to work from home and thank you so much for joining us today Martine how are you doing I'm um, great thanks thanks for having me no probs at all. We're really grateful for your time. And, you know, as I was just alluding to earlier on, there is no doubt that life has been challenging. And I guess many households have really struggled um, these last few months. Um, and I'd love to know from your perspective, what do you think has been the biggest challenge for everyone at the moment? Well, I think I think there's been lots of challenges, certainly. And um, I think obviously like, like adjusting to to a really different way of living and learning and working has meant that, you know, we've got to we've got to change our, our, our mindset around things. We've had to change logistically around things. And, and I think so a lot of it has just come down to just that overwhelm. So parents are just feeling like there's a lot of stuff that they have to do, a lot of stuff that they don't understand. And then we've got all of this use of screens and these are taking over our lives. And so there's just, um, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that, that the parents are now having to deal with and, and manage as well as look after themselves and look after their families, keep their own businesses going. You know, there's just been a lot of, a lot of overwhelm, I think, that um, the parents have been experiencing at this time. Yeah. Um, definitely. And it's not just one thing, it's a multitude of lots of different things. Hey, <laughs> now we published your article and the title is five wellbeing tips to live, learn and to work from home. For someone who hasn't read the article, can you give us a little bit of an overview um, to tell us what it's about and also just what inspired you to write it? Mm. Yeah, well, I guess I was inspired to write it because I was seeing from a lot of my own readers and even in my own social circles and on my own feeds and my friendship groups that there was this, this feeling of overwhelm and this feeling of how am I supposed to get all of this stuff done and how am I supposed to you know, keep the family and the household running smoothly when this is an area that, that you know, um, is, is something that's very new. And as you said, there's no, there's no recipe, there's no outline for us. So it, and it happened so quickly. So I, I guess I wanted to help families um, and particularly parents focus on how they can look after their own well-being and in doing so, you know, look after the well-being of their families. So I guess I just wanted to, to outline just some, some steps to take or even just some mindsets to have in order to, to help parents through this time. So it's things like really looking at your own individual experience and your own family's experiences this time and and what is important to your family right now? What are your family's needs? Um, we're all in very, very different situations. And even though we're all locked down and, and experiencing the same global pandemic, our individual experiences in our families and our households are very different. And so, you know, we want to be careful that we're not comparing ourselves to what everybody else is doing and, and, and seemingly achieving, um, but making sure we're looking at what do we need right now in this household and what, what, what do our kids need and how am I going to be able to, you know, to, to best um, get that done. So certainly running our own race, or I even put in brackets for that first point, shuffling if you have to. If we're just shuffling <laughs> along, um, then, that, then that's okay too. You know, really, because I think, it, I think more, more importantly than ever, our, our well-being is, is 
that, that you know the thing that we need to be focusing on um, because if we don't have that because we're in such close quarters with each other because our kids are feeding off our emotions and we're setting the tone of the household I think you know we we have to make sure that we're looking after that first and foremost if we're going to have any hope of our kids you know getting work done or remote learning and all those sorts of things because um, we've all seen what happens when you know I'm sure we've all experienced you know when we thought we were going to achieve all of these things um, with our remote learning and all those sorts of things and they can very quickly go out the window and, and we, you know, we didn't quite achieve everything that we wanted. Our kids didn't quite concentrate the way we thought they would. And, and so we can, everything can quickly unravel. So I guess I want parents to really just look at what are my circumstances now? How do I run my own race? And, and that might mean having things like some structure to your day, but working out what works for your family. If your family is, and your kids are, um, work by, you know, structure and, you know, those really strict timetables, then do that. If that's not really going to work for you, then don't, you know, don't hold yourself to those things. And I think even having those, those structures, they do need to be a little bit flexible because we all, as we, you know, as we've seen, things can unravel quickly or the kid's just not in the mood to do this right now. The sun's out, let's get outside. You know, we, 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 want, we want to be able to change things up as well. So having that structure there, but also keeping it flexible and I'd also talk about the importance of, um, you know, having some routines and rituals, trying to maintain some that we had already from, from time pre-COVID, but also even just creating some new ones is really important um, because that helps give, um, gives kids a little bit of stability and a little bit of knowing what's going on, in a, you know, at a time where we don't know a lot about what's going on. Just having those little routines and rituals can really help them, you know, just um, get some of that stability and that normalcy back. Um, and then we also want to look at, you know, there's lots of other ways that kids are learning at the moment. So, you know, if they're not sitting down for you and, and doing their, their curriculum or their math sheet so well today, then, you know, maybe there's something else you can do. Maybe you can go and bake a cake together and, you know, all those sorts of things just to, to work out what's, what's working for you at the moment. Now, obviously, it's a bit different when you've got those older children um, who, who have a lot more structure to their, their day and their timetable. But with the younger ones, I think we can, you know, be prepared to be a little bit more flexible and, and recognise that there's going to be a whole lot of ways that they can learn. And then finally, you know, I think it's important that, you know, we really communicate with each other all the time um, around what's going on, you know, what we're all feeling and um, how, why we've had to make changes, what, what, they, what do they look like now, what are they going to look like in the future, you know, just trying to have some conversations and keep it, keep it all open so that the kids understand that, you know, that, you know, this is, it is a different time, but um, we don't want it to be something that they're you know, really scared of. We want to try and keep it, you know, a little bit light as well and, and try and show them some positives as well. So trying to communicate a lot of that um, throughout. That's just wonderful. And we'll have a link to that article, um, which we're going to speak about more in a moment too. Um, but thank you for, for sharing all of those, those, those tips. Now, um, you know, studies have really shown us, I guess, when children are in a regular routine, and they can um, recall the times in their day that they, um, I guess, have, they know something is going to happen um, and they've got that sense of structure, um, they are more likely to feel a sense of well-being and security. So can you tell us a little bit more about this, um, I guess, this, this point of view and, and this, this thought process? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, it, as I said, when we have um, a lot of uncertainty in our life or we don't, we have a lot of questions that, that you know, we can't always answer and, and certainly parents are not able to answer all their kids' questions at the moment. Um, I think it's really important for them to have some things that remain secure and remain structured and remain that this is just, this is going to still happen. So regardless of whatever else is going on in the world, I know that every night um, mum or dad reads me a story before bed. Or I know that in the morning we sit and have our brekkie together and we, and we have a chat about something. Or we go and get a milkshake at this time. Or we take the dog for a walk at this time. And it, even those little, those little routines and rituals, it can be enough just to, to remind kids that, you know, things, things are going to be okay and things can, can move along as long as we've got some sense of, you know, there is, there is still some structure to our day. But there's also just, there's just some things that are still going to happen. And it just provides them a, a little bit of certainty. Um, in, in that this world that is yeah, still uncertain so we can as I said create new rituals for this time yeah um, you know they might because we're all home a lot more um, you know we can be doing things that we may may not have been able to do before so we might be walking the dog in the middle of the day or we might be going in, um, down to a park and kicking a ball or whatever it is and that might be something that we do every day or most days or um, you know trying to to you know bring some of these things in so that they can feel like there is some some certainty around what, what, what happens to their day. 
Mm, and you mentioned that there um, are so many ways that our kids can learn that doesn't rely just on curriculum itself, um, but it's still going to be so important for their own growth and development. Now, in the article, you provide a fantastic list. Um, I think it's point number four, I think it is, if I can recall. Um, so would, could you possibly just run through some of those with us because they are fantastic ideas? Yeah, well... I guess my first one, for those of us that have more than one child, it's um, hanging out with siblings is in itself a learning experience because <laughs> they're under one roof together. They're having to play with the same sorts of things or they're, you know, they're, they're having to take turns. So there's conflict negotiation and there's all those sorts of things. And yep. um, so certainly resource sharing, sharing our toys, sharing the control of the PS4, whatever it is. So certainly, you know, just learning to live um, in confined spaces with, you know, um, the same people every day has been certainly a great learning experience for many. Um, but there's a whole range of other activities that we can do as well that don't just revolve around our curriculum based um, learning. So even, you know, um, playing those video games can certainly, you know, give us some skills and some coordination and hand eye coordination and spatial awareness and tracking and thinking outside the box, <laughs> and, you know, thinking of the best way to build, build your city on Minecraft or, or whatever it is you're doing. There's lots of, of learning that happens there. Um, even just, you know, listening to your audio books, reading, all those sorts of things are still obviously we're learning. Um, yeah, even just some some little chores and things that we have to do. You know, there's there's things that they might be doing now that they they didn't have to do before, or we didn't make them do because we're too busy running around. It was easier just to you know make their own our own us make their lunch or whatever it is. So even giving them little chores like making up you know their lunch, um, packing up their toys and their games, all those sorts of things. Doing a few household chores, maybe having a go at cooking a meal with you or or you know baking something all of these sorts of skills that they can be learning that um, we might now have some of the time to 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 give them um, obviously just all of our physical activities anything anytime we're you know going outside going for a walk you know kicking a ball again we're still learning and we're still working on a whole lot of skills as well um, you know and just even just hanging out with our kids sitting on the couch watching a movie together it's still important time and it's still, it's still um, allowing them to grow. And, and, and it's also just, uh, you know, a way that we can also help reflect with them and, and, and help show them that they've, they've got some resilience that they've been building on because there was a lot of things that have changed for them and, and look at what we can do when, um, even when we, you know, if somebody had said, you're going to have all of these things taken away from you, um, it's a pretty scary prospect. But then when we can, you know, sit with our kids and reflect a little bit we can remind them that you know they've been able to achieve lots of great things and they've been able to overcome um you know some big obstacles you know missing out on birthday parties and seeing their friends and playing their sport and their competition and all those sorts of things um have been massive losses for them but um i think even just being able to 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 reflect and and and, and talk about those things as well can be really helpful and and, and a good way for them to realize that in the future, there'll be more obstacles in their life. Um, but, you know, we, we know that we, you know, we can certainly um, try and overcome these and, and we have before, so we, we can again. Yeah, and they're really great tips, um, I guess, for any parent that may be concerned at the moment about um, their children you know, feeling that their children aren't learning enough. There are lessons in everything that we do, you know, all day, every day. And I think that list really gives a great um, sort of insight into sort of having that that perspective of, well, there's a lesson in every one thing and, you know, um, you can sort of go through one by one to help you sort of feel that you are sort of, you know, continuing their education and lifelong learning um, whilst they're at home in, in isolation um, at the moment. And, you know, that being said, I guess for parents as well, there's a lot of concerns that parents are feeling for themselves. So I'd love to know from your perspective, what are some things that parents can, can do to look after themselves at this time as well? Yeah. Well, I think it's really important, yeah, that parents do look after um, after themselves. I know we you know, we talk about self-care and things like that, but I do think they're really important, um, particularly at this time, because it can be easy for us to put everybody else foot first and, you know, making sure that we're looking after the, the kids and that they're getting all of their needs yeah. met. But, you know, we know we can't do that if we're not looking after ourselves first. So I think, you know, just being really practical with the sorts of things that we need. If you need to go for a walk on your own, then you need to go for a walk on your own. If you need to have some time out, if you need to ask for some help from the family members, you know, we ask for help. 
Um, so really, and again, just trying to have that mindset of looking at what, what do you and your individual families need um, without looking at what everybody else is doing? Because I think that's what has really got a lot of um, parents um, really caught up in this overwhelm is this looking at, you know, I can't, I can't do everything the way everybody else is doing it. You know, such and such as, you know, making sourdough bread every day and such and such as learning a new language and I'm just barely managing to get through the day. And so I think the biggest thing we can do for ourselves and our self-care is to um, run our own race, look at, look at our own needs and, and then, you know, know that if we're looking after what we know we need, we're going to be in a much better position to, to you know, translate that to our kids. Yeah. And um, you mentioned in the fifth point in the article about the importance of communication. And um, I'd like to read a little bit out from that, from that, um, that part of the article. So in, in your own words, you know, just because um, we're pretty much living on top of each other at the moment doesn't mean um, we're always communicating well. And more than ever, it is crucial that we keep connecting, talking, listening, um, and discussing the challenges as they arise. So when people feel heard, they feel that they have a say in how things are managed. Um, and there is a much greater likelihood of compromise and understanding um, the likelihood of harmony and sanity for all. So can you tell us a little bit more about why you think this is so important at the moment and more so than ever? Yeah, like. Yeah, well, I think we are all, because we are all living together, it kind of assumes that we all know everything that's going on with each other and we all you know, get everybody's challenges and all those sorts of things. And, and that's, you know, probably very rarely the case and probably less so now. So because we're, we're, we are spending a lot of time together and we're doing lots of things together, but we're not necessarily always communicating with what our needs are right now. And it's also important that not only are we talking to um, our family members, but also if we're working, uh, making sure that our colleagues and um, um, our peers, that they understand what, what are our needs at the moment and what's our situation at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe we can't get on that Zoom call at nine o'clock because I'm trying to start, you know, working with my kids at that time. Or, so it's really making sure that we, we make, get, let our needs be known to, to everybody that's um, you know, around us at the moment. So in terms of our, our partners, uh, making sure that we're, you know, looking at what's on in on our day. How is this going to work? I'm actually going to need some time to do this. Can you take the kids then? And all those sorts of things need to be communicated so that we're not, you know, building up resentment um, with each other or all those sorts of things. And again, telling our kids, you know, that, you know, I'm also running a business if that's the case. And um, so I'm going to need time to do some, some things as well. And these are the times when I can't give you my attention or, or, or whatever it is. So, um, you know, letting, letting everybody know what, what, what needs to happen in a day and what, and what your needs are as well so that we, um, we can, again, make sure that we're trying to limit the conflict, but also, you know, make sure that we're all listening to each other as well. And we are starting to like transition out of this time now. Um, so how, how do you think, I guess, parents will manage the, the changes um, and, and also with kids managing, I guess, a reduction in screen time um, and a return to possibly sort of firmer boundaries with the amount of time they're going to be spending in front of a computer? Yeah, well, obviously we've had, you know, huge amounts of, of screen time, most families, I imagine, um, much more than they, they would have previously. So I think it's really important to recognise that this, that increased screen time was part of a time and part of a necessity because we needed it to learn, we needed it to work, we needed it to connect with our, our friends and our family, we needed it to be entertained because a lot of the normal means of all of those things have been taken away. So we, we have to, you know, recognise that, you know, this was why we needed to increase this screen time. But as things start to go back to normal, whatever that normal is going to look like, um, there are going to be changes. And again, that's why it's, it's really important we communicate that to our kids that, you know, yes, I know I let you play two hours of, of Minecraft, you know, the other day, but that's because I had an important meeting that has to happen <laughs> or whatever it is. And, um, and so it, it is okay to communicate that. But, you know, when things go back, um, when you're back at school and you've got other things happening, then we, we don't need to have that same sort of um, time because you know you, you have other avenues of being entertained, you have other avenues of of, um, of connecting with your friends and and all of that. So you know it, it, we will be you know maybe take change, changing the rules again and working out what's going to work again in our family situation. And so it doesn't have to mean that we go completely cold turkey on them and shut everything down the day they go back <laughs> to school. I think. 
I think we want to sort of, you know, again, because as these restrictions are eased, um, so too can our restrictions in our home be eased a little bit as well. Nice. But just also doing it, you know, doing it slowly and, and um, you know, looking at, at, um, at how they're coping as well and, um, and just trying to slowly get things back to normal. And that will also be the, the case when they, they go back to school and maybe they're not going to go back to all of their extracurricular activities at the one time. So, you know, it, these things might happen a lot more slowly. So um, it's just, again, none of us really know what, what's happening, you know, in weeks to come. So it's really just taking each, each day as it comes and, and working out, you know, what are, what are our kids' needs right now and, and you know, how are we best going to do that for them? And the other question I was going to ask also is about social media. You know, it really, for many, has helped us stay connected at a time when we have been sort of physically segregated. Um, but one of the negative things, and as you mentioned earlier on um, about social media, is the fact, fact that it really, um, that many people consciously maybe even subconsciously end up comparing their lives to others. So um, let's face it, really on social media, you only really see the highlights or the show real people's lives, which is all of the good stuff or the shiny stuff. Um, but, you know, in reality, this isn't a healthy thing. Um, and in, in this scenario, I guess at the moment where people are already going through a bit of a challenging time, it could be almost a little bit sort of poisonous I guess at the, at, you know in some instances for everybody to be watching these things when we're already for a lot of people maybe quite sensitive or in a fragile state depending on what they're going through so I'd love to know um, what's your advice for anyone that has found themselves in this situation lately that they've they've been a little bit sort of sensitive um, in what's going on in their life and of course for a mental break let's say they they jump onto to social media and then they're going through their thread and they're seeing other people as you said earlier on you know I'm doing this and I'm learning a language and I'm doing all these wonderful things what's your thoughts on on this and how can people navigate their way, way around it yeah well I guess it's one of those real catch-22s isn't it because yes we want to stay connected and it does help us in some ways it might be motivating us or inspiring us um, but for others, it might be really, really taxing on our well-being, and we might be comparing ourselves, and we might be feeling excluded, or we might be feeling like we're not achieving or not good enough. And, and it's very easy for us to say, oh, you know, you're only getting the highlights real, and it's not really that great, and you know, don't compare yourself. But it's, it's one of the real challenges I think for everyone, not only for for our kids, but for, for obviously for adults as well. So I guess the way I, I try and get um, young people and, and parents as well to look at this is to think, um, how can I be really mindful of what I'm scrolling and what I'm feeding into myself and into my daily life? And so trying to be conscious when we are having that time of just scrolling through our feeds, you know, at whatever the end of the day or whenever we're just scrolling and really trying to be conscious of what am I getting out of this? Um, how is it making me feel right now? And are these the people I should be following? Yes. Or, or maybe there's a few people I might just have to have to mute at the moment because yeah, they're my friend, but they're not helpful for me at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, and try and just be, yeah, just be really mindful of, of what we're scrolling through, what we're reading, how much news am I getting? How much news am I feeding to my kids? You know, is it helpful for me? Um, or do I need to just have a, have a good look at, at what I'm consuming and, um, and maybe change some of those habits to make sure that I'm doing stuff that I know is going to be healthier for me so that when I get off, when I finish that scrolling, that I actually feel better than I did when I get on. Because if That's I'm coming thing. off feeling worse, yeah. um, then it's, it's really waste, wasting my time and actually hurting my time so, and hurting my, my well-being. So really yeah, getting good at, at trying to be a little bit more conscious of how we, how we spend that time online. Yeah. And is that something... Do you think people should be doing almost on a daily basis? I mean, I mean, how often should be people having that, that check in with themselves? Do you think? Yeah, well, I think I think as much as we can. I mean, I know that we do a lot of our scrolling absent mind, mindedly, and a lot of it just happens on the fly. But I think if we can, you know, just try and and, and be conscious every time we go online and, and every time we finish scrolling, thinking, well, what did I get from that? You know, yeah. was I inspired or mo motivated by what I saw? Was I feeling supported and, and all of that? Or did I come off feeling, wow, that makes me feel really crappy or, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling great about things now. And maybe I need to look at well, what are those things that made me feel that way? Who are those people? What are those sites that I'm following? What is it that I'm reading that's making me feel that way? Um, and maybe I need to just curate my feed a little bit differently right now. And that might mean that I block a few people at the moment or yep. just hide, hide them or, 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 you know, just looking at our... our 
even looking at when I'm looking at social media, you know, um, if I know I'm feeling vulnerable, is that going to be the best time for me to get online um, or shall I try and do something else? So I guess it's just all, all about just being more aware and more conscious of how we're spending our time online and, and who, we're, who we're allowing into our life, really. It's been a catch-22, really, hasn't it? Because, as I said before, where we have sort of been home in isolation, the online world has given us access to the to the rest of the world. And I'm not sure how a lot of people would have been able to get through the last few months without access um, mm-hmm. and the use of the online world. But, you know, for yourself as a digital wellbeing and safety officer, um, you know, I'd love to know from your perspective what you can see as being the pros and cons of the online world, especially at this point in time, starting with the pros, like what would you see as being, I guess, all of the good stuff? Well, yeah, I think the good stuff is that it has allowed us to um, obviously to work and to learn and to continue lives um, as, as not normally, but, but as close to as we can. If we didn't have, have this, we wouldn't be working or learning and all of those. So it would be quite different. So allowing um, people to continue that sort of um, part of their life, but then obviously allowing them to stay connected um, because we know that you know, connection is, you know, is huge for humans. Um, it's, it's something that we, we need to survive. And so giving us that ability to still stay connected to our, our friends and our work colleagues and our families um, and, and same for our kids. You know, we know that for kids and particularly teenagers as well, their, their social lives are pretty much everything for most yeah. at the moment. So, so having that ability to stay connected for them is has been crucial. So, so you know for those reasons, um, you know the technology has been um, has been great for us at this time, and, and as well as you know lots of other things. Yes, it's allowed us to be entertained, and you know we can watch all our live music streamed and all those sorts of things, and we're you know we're able to play games and all of that. So <laughs> it's it's provided. Um, you know, it's filled a lot of voids that that um, has been taken away from us. Yeah. Um, but then, what about the cons? You know, obviously, yes, <laughs> there's plenty of cons as well. And I guess that comes with, you know, what we usually find as the, as the downsides of, of, you know, the online world is things that, yeah, we're on it for so long, but we know that that's not good for us. You know, it's not good for us physically, for our posture, our, you know, our, our eyesight and all those sorts of things is not great. And, you know, but also just um, for, you know, knowing being so connected all day can be exhausting. Yes. Um, you know, I know that a lot of ki- kids have complained that, you know, you're on you're online schooling all day and then, you know, you still want to catch up with your friends and then you still need to use it to, to play or have that downtime. That's a long time that we're yes. you know, online. So it's, it's, it's that over, overuse then. And that means that we're obviously avoiding some of the things or not getting some of the things that we, we certainly need. So we still need lots of active um, time and time to be outside and in nature and, and maybe that's taking away from some of that time. Um, you know, we certainly need just, you know, chilling out time, time to just to be and relax and, you know, all those sorts of things. So there's certainly lots of things that we are missing out on while we're using the technology and, and there needs that, it, this is always the case, you know, that we always look at what's, what's been taken away when we're using the technology, but I think because we've used it so much at this time, it does mean some of those needs might not be being met for everybody. So there's certainly been some cons. And look, we've, we've also seen um, that there has been a massive increase in cyberbullying, a massive increase in um, wow. um, online abuse and those sorts of things. And, um, and that's directly related to the fact that there's more of us online. Um, there has been more, you know, predator activity, all those sorts of things that have always been the downsides of the online world have increased over the last you know, six to eight weeks. Um, and we can only put that down to the fact that there's more of us online and online for longer. So, um, you know, there's certainly there's certainly some of the downsides um, that we have experienced. Yeah, and I guess for the family overall, um, and you know, I guess the, the amount of time that we can sort of spend on the. Um, I guess, access to uh, Netflix and internet streaming services and all that sort of stuff, which can be really addictive. So I just wanted to know from your perspective, what can we sort of do as a family to ensure our mental health when we can sort of just get (laughs) sucked into watching all of this stuff, you know, on Netflix and and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I actually just saw a funny um, meme today. It was something (laughs) like, you know, when is Netflix series two coming out? And it was like, you know, they've literally done the whole of Netflix. So um, you know, and I guess that is the thing that it, it, the devices do answer a lot of our perceived needs. So they are entertaining us and informing us and socialising us and connecting us and all of those things. And so it's very easy for us to think, well, I can get some entertainment 
entertainment for the next few hours just from this device or from my computer screen or or from the television or whatever it is and so it's very easy just to rely on that and it's easy and it's there and it's accessible but I guess for all of us we we know that we have so many other needs that need to be met and so I think parents do have to work a little bit harder um, as I think they do in normal times but I do think we have to work a little bit harder to make sure that our kids all of those other needs are being met. And that means we, yeah, we might have to all stop everything we're doing and say, yeah, we're going out for a walk or we're all going out to do something. Um, or, you know, we're all going to play a game right now that doesn't involve a screen or, you know, I need you to help me in the kitchen now. And just trying yeah. to, to um, you know, give them plenty of other opportunities to do other things that we know that they need. Um, because it's not always obvious to them because they're quite happy, you know, doing what they're doing and feeling like they're getting you know, some of those needs met. But I think it's, I think we do need to work a, a little bit harder at times to just try and make sure that, you know, we are helping them see that there's a lot of other things that they need. Mm. And I'd love to ask you about dopamine. Like, what are your thoughts? Do you think Aussies overall and people all around the globe really have an addiction to it? And really what are the concern, concerning sort of side effects that really it can sort of have, have a, on, on us and what does it cause and that sort of stuff? Look, I guess dopamine gets released whenever we do something that makes us feel good. And so it's not necessarily always a bad thing, you know, when we're having a great time with our friends dopamine gets released you know when we're connecting with people when we're doing something we enjoy when we're dancing whatever that is dopamine gets released and so that's okay um i think what happens is when we start to rely on it um, from ways that are not so healthy for us then it can become a problem so for example we know that um you know our games are made in ways that want us to stay online. You know, the, the gamers, are, the creators are pretty pretty clever at making sure that, you know, um, we know the hooks, we know all of the things that your brain likes. So we know what we need to do in this game to keep you online. And so that means that dopamine is continually being released because there's always another level to go to in that game or there's always another city to create or another army to conquer the next or, thing, or whatever the next it thing. is. Or there's, there's always something something more to do. And so that makes it really tricky for us to then naturally um, put the devices away or stop playing or whatever, because, you know, it, it feels good. So, you know, when something feels good, we don't naturally put it away, even though we know that, you know, playing for six or eight hours is not going to be good for us. And so that's where I think parents just need to be monitoring how, how that whatever that is that they're doing, whether it's game playing or social media, how that's affecting that their child and and whether or not they have the ability to put it down when they need, making sure you're not having a tantrum when you ask them to put it down. So that might mean we need to, you know, talk about why we have some boundaries about around it. It's not because I want to ruin all your fun, but it's because these devices are made with these hooks to keep us online. So I need to make sure that you're able to regulate your own behaviours as you get older. So I might need to help you do that now. And that means, you know, and that's a lot of adults experiences as well. We all know that we've been scrolling for five minutes and two hours has gone past <laughs> and, you know, we haven't achieved a lot, but, you know, so um, I think it's, I think it's a, a challenge for, for all of us, but I guess, you know, I don't like to talk too much in terms of, you know, addiction. I think it's more about managing, um, managing the way we use the devices and managing the effects that it has on us and looking at well, what are those effects having on me? And then do I need to make some changes therefore? Yeah. And in, in, uh, in addition to the dopamine, I guess a lot, there's a lot of games like Fortnite as an, as an example, it's a really highly adrenalized, fast paced game. I was watching my nephew play it um, just last week and I was just shocked how fast it just moves. And I was just like, you know, my brain on an average day moves a hundred miles an hour. I couldn't keep up with it. And this really has young kids addicted to the adrenaline rush. Mm. Um, so I'd love to understand um, along with the dopamine, what do you think with the adrenaline that, that's running through their, their bodies as well? Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, I think, you know, studies are starting to show us that, yes, we are starting to change our brains because we are able to respond in different ways to things. You know, we're no longer working in those linear patterns where we went from front to back of a book or, you know, top to bottom where we're jumping all over the place because that's what the technology often requires of us. So, um, and certainly we can see that when kids are playing games. Now, again, some kids can play those games like Fortnite and they can play it for however long and then they can happily put it down and go on and, and do something else and it not have a bigger impact. 
but for other kids it can have a big impact on them you know it can make them more more aggressive or it can you know they you know make them um really reluctant to to, to stop and and so you know i always do say to, to parents really have a look at your individual child and how they're coping and and have those discussions about why we might need to then put some boundaries around it because you know yeah it's it's it has you know they as i said they have some hooks and they have all of those things that make it difficult for us to put it away and so i want to make sure that we're looking after your well-being as well um and a, and a good tip for boys who are, are on particularly because they're usually the ones playing those sorts of games um, is to get them to do something active once they've finished those games because there uh -huh. is a lot of testosterone that gets built built up and you know that they, they, they are you know they, they are you know, annihilating an army or whatever it is that they're doing so um, you know getting them to just have some even if it's a bit of rough and tumble and wrestle with their with their brother or going out and shooting some hoops can help um, you know really relax them and get them um, calm again so um, I always you know encourage them to do something active afterwards and and always try and you know have that as something that they can go on with afterwards okay that's enough of that activity now let's move on to another activity um not always about trying to take it away from them but just trying to explain to them there's a whole lot of other things you need to fit into your day that's why we have to stop this now and, and go on and do something else mm, you've shared some really insightful information with us today i guess if you were to summarize i guess your key messages for anyone watching or listening what would they be yeah, look, I think it's just really important as parents that we make sure we're paying close attention to, to what our kids are doing. That doesn't mean we have to you know, keep up with every single app or game or thing that they're doing or follow every conversation that they're having. But stay engaged with your kids at this time. Use this time to, to find out the sorts of things that they like to do and use this time to help, help teach them some skills that they might need online and help, help try and regulate some of those boundaries by giving them a whole lot of other things that they they need to do into their day so that we can kind of i guess try and build up some good habits some patterns for when we do um you know head back into whatever is normal and <laughs> and make sure that we're really op opening up that conversation and so that we we want our kids to to feel they can come to us if things go wrong online so i i always say to parents don't set it up as the bad guy and something that we've got to you know block and ban and control um look at it as something that we have to work with because it's not going anywhere um, and, you know, we have just seen how we've been able to use it in many positive ways. So let's try and nurture the positive ways with our kids and, and try and help them avoid you know, all the more challenging aspects of it. Mm. And if parents have got any other information or um, sorry, any questions for you, I'm so sorry, um, or they want more information, whereabouts can they find you? Yeah, well, they can head to my, um, my website, which is themodernparents.net. Um, and um, obviously I write on my blog regularly there. Um, I also have my book on there, um, which I've just released, which is um, Parenting in a Digital World. Thank you. And, um, and yeah, I do regularly update on my Facebook page, just the latest um, trends and apps and, and reviews and things like that as well that um, can help parents with the, the more practical sides of, of parenting in a digital world. So, um, yeah, you'll, you'll find me. Wonderful. We'll definitely have the link um, in the in the introduction paragraph and in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time and can't wait to chat with you again soon. Take care. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye.